Hello, everyone. People are still streaming in by the hundreds, by the dozens anyway. Um, good to see you all joining us. Uh, if you're looking for the Medical Apartheid and Structural Racism event sponsored by the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington, you are in the right place. If you thought you were going into something else, you're probably not in the right place. But uh, great to see so many of you coming and signing up. Um, I'm going to jump right in here. We don't want to lose time on this important topic. Uh, my name is James Pfeiffer. I am a professor in the Department of Global Health. I am also DEI director uh, for the Department of Global Health. And the panel we are sponsoring today is um, sponsored and put on by the Department of Global Health, but with uh, in collaboration, co-sponsored by the Washington Fair Trade Coalition and Health Advocacy International. Uh, so it is a collaborative effort. Um, and we are thrilled to have the panelists who I won't introduce yet. Um, I'm going to hand over the reins here, having welcomed you all. Um, just a couple words about the program. We're going to go through some individual presentations by each of our, our panelists and some question and answer with them for about an hour or so to cover the bases. And then after that, we're going to have an open uh, Q&A for those of you in the audience to ask questions of our panelists. Um, and then after that Q&A, we're going to have what we're calling kind of a call to action, a discussion of different ways in which people who have joined us can get active and engage in the advocacy around these issues of both trade justice, uh, debt justice, and um, uh, social justice and global health. So we really encourage everybody to stick around um, for as long as you can through that process. Uh, chat is not going to be enabled for the wider um, uh, participants because it just can become quite distracting. But you can put chat messages in that will go to the hosts of the project. If you need to reach out to us about anything, we can see the chat messages coming in. And if you have some questions that you would like us to ask in the Q&A period, you can write those down, but we'll also be taking people who raise their hands at the end. Um, so that's how we're going to be operating things um, uh, for, the, for the event. And I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Rachel Chapman, who is going to be our moderator uh, for the event. And Dr. Chapman is uh, associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. She's a medical anthropologist who has done her career work in global health, both uh, abroad in Mozambique and here in Seattle. And she's going to be our moderator uh, tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Chapman. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to wait for James to turn off his microphone. Great. Welcome, welcome from wherever you are. I'm going to do something that they do more and more so that you all aren't silent for the whole. I'm going to ask you to come off uh, of mute and just greet everybody. Just audience. Hello, hello. Thank hi, you. Hi, hi. hi hello. Hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Beautiful. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Chapman and I'm in the Department of Anthropology and Adjunct here in Global Health and it's an honor to be working with this group of folks on this forum this afternoon. Today's Department of Global Health, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee Forum called Medical Apartheid and Global Health focuses on structural racism at a global scale and how it is enacted and produced through a global economic and political architecture that denies access to basic health and social services to many in the global south. Intellectual property and pat patent rights enforced through WTO mediated trade agreements on one end and debt distress and austerity programs on the other have both prevented access to basic life-saving medical care and social services and prevented progress towards universal health coverage. Both sets of policies also lead to the ongoing moral crisis of the way corporate interests, including big pharma and banking interests, put profit and business interests above saving lives 
To quote Hilma Nakambali, who's one of our interlocutors on the panel today in her YouTube video on the topic of vaccine apartheid, quote, capitalism thrives even in times of desperate need, sometimes, and, and I add, sometimes benefiting from that need. Our panelists today will help us understand this nexus of global processes and forces at work by laying out just how structural racism, the international debt crisis, and austerity policies intersect in medical apartheid and keeps a deadly knee on the neck of the global south and how we can join efforts to push back. I wanna welcome our panelists who will introduce themselves uh, in more detail as we go through, but we have a format of having um, a graduate student from Global Health to introduce our panelists and to be an interlocutor asking questions. Today, I'm proud and excited to welcome Dr. Shamika Poetry Thomas, Dr. Maza Sayum, Dr. Aldo Cagliari, and Dr. Arthur Stamilis. Welcome. And I'll hand it over to Tiara Ranson from the Department of uh, Global Health to introduce our first speaker. Hi, my name is Tiara Ranson. I am super excited and overjoyed to introduce my mentor. I've known her even before my time at the University of Washington, like even when I was an undergrad. And to have her carry in this, in this experience now that I'm in you know, in grad school and everything just means so much. Um, but let me get into the introduction. So Dr. Shamika Poetry Thomas is a global maternal and child health scientist and a medical sociologist at Harvard University School of Public Health. She's currently an early career principal investigator of the Sickle Cell Women and Girls Project of Accra, Ghana, specifically called SWAG. Um, and so she's collecting data at the Ghana Institute of Clinical Genetics. Dr. Thomas completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Human Genomics Research Institute, where her scientific research focused on patient perceptions of non-invasive prenatal testing among Black women with genetic conditions such as sickle cell disease. Dr. Thomas received her PhD from the University of Miami, where her dissertation entitled Giving Birth in South Florida, a phenomenological study on the pregnancy and birthing experiences among Black women. It was actually nominated for the most outstanding dissertation award at the American Sociological Association, uh, specifically the medical sociology, sociology section um, in 2020. And she was also invited to be a speaker on her scientific research at the Harvard Medical School's Physicians for Human Rights in 2019 and the Maternal Health Policy Summit at um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2018. Dr. Thomas has won various, various research grants and a variety of publications. One of her co-authored publications on pregnancy and birthing experiences among Black women was listed as one of the top 20 most downloaded articles in the Sociology Compass Journal between 2018 and 2019. And going back even further, <laughs> yes, and going back even further, Dr. Thomas is alumna of Spelman College, which is a historically Black college for women. And so where her research was also is also amazing. <laughs> and she won the Scholar Activism Award at Spelman. And so she was one of the most distinguished global health scholars um, at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and the University of um, California, specifically Berkeley. Um, Dr. Thomas loves being authentic to her soul and is well known as a poet. Um, and a yoga and meditation instructor. And also she is a mother to her 11 year old daughter. So I'm super like grateful for the opportunity to present you guys, my amazing mentors and to hear what she has to say about racism on a global scale. And now that she's in Ghana to hear about her perceptions, how they might've changed and specifically coming now with the context of the medical apartheid. After that stellar, I think that that was such an incredible introduction that we lost the speaker. So we are going to, it's no doubt a Wi-Fi. Oh, you are back. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tiara. That was really graceful.
uh, Letty, Dr. Shamika is back and can be. Oh, okay. Um, she has not yet appeared. On yes, the she's here. She's up in the top of my scroll. So maybe you need to just scroll. Just unmute her. Yes, if you unmute. The host has muted me. Ugh. Oh, there you are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We know it's the middle Hello. of the where you are. <laughs> so this is a gift on all levels. And thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's my, it's my honor and pleasure. It is uh, truly a gift. And um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I was trying to click the mute button, but I realized the host, I think, had muted the audience. So it's it's working perfectly now. <laughs> awesome. So uh, where how do I start after that beautiful introduction? Uh, Tiara uh, is one of my former students um, from the University of Miami, and we've uh, co-authored a few papers together. And so I'm just so proud of her scholarship and her trajectory. And I just thank you for this opportunity. So uh, should I begin or are there the other introductions of the panelists as well? Okay, We're going to introduce everybody in these sort of threads that we're braiding together and you're the framework. So oh, okay. We'll... Awesome. Okay. So without further ado, I'll just jump in. So um, I'm just pretty much framing the, the conversation for this, this evening, this afternoon. And uh, I'll speak for about uh, five minutes or so. And then I'll just kind of hand the floor back over to you all. I do want to um, let you all know that I typically start with a dedication or speak their names uh, to set the tone and set the groundwork for my research. And I typically try to do that in every talk um, that I give. So for this occasion and um, uh, moment in time, I would like to uh, give honor to the scholars who have come before me. Um, such as Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. I speak his name at this moment. Uh, he has set uh, an amazing transformational um, tra transformational groundwork for the work that I do here in Ghana. If you aren't familiar with Dr. E. B., um, W.E.B. Du Bois, he is a writer of Souls of Black Folk. He also uh, wrote Dark Water. And these are those are two of my favorite pieces by him. Uh, he is one of the first uh, Black uh, PhDs at, in the US to receive a PhD from Harvard University. And he also is arguably uh, one of the first sociological, empirical social scientists um, in the sociological canon. Um, Alden Morris wrote a book about him called uh, Scholar Denied, which he is typically denied as a scholar um, due to his race. Um, but he largely shaped how we see sociology and how we see global dynamics um, across the world. Um, in his latter years, he decided to leave the US and he um, um, came to Ghana and where he transitioned when he got to Ghana. So the, there's libraries and museums named after him here. There are roads named after him here. Uh, he's done um, a major work with a lot of revolutionaries uh, that has built the infrastructure for Ghana. And um, it's just amazing. Um, his actual home that he resided here um, is still intact and still uh, present for tourists and touring. So I just say his name as a tribute to the legacy of that uh, type of scholarship that has cross so many borders, so many oceans to do this work. And it has definitely grounded the work that I do today here in Ghana and in the US. So W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, I begin this talk with a heavy heart. Um, I will be honest with you. I, um, as working in Ghana, there's some atrocities and of course, international debts that has really made it tremendously difficult to do the work that I do here in Ghana. I collect data on uh, female adolescents and uh, women and girls uh, who have sickle cell disease here at the Kali Blue Teacher Hospital near Jamestown. Can you all hear me? Yes.
I think uh, Dr. Thomas just froze. We lost, we lost her. Um, we can wait a second for her to come back in. Um, in the meantime, I am going to introduce our next speaker, if that would be okay. And as soon as, oh, she's back. I'm ready. Can you all hear me? We lost Hello? you. We lost you for a brief second, and you're okay. Back. Welcome back. My, my, I'm currently in Ghana right now, and we're in the rainy season, so the internet and the power is very shaky, and it is twelve thirty midnight <laughs> here. So please pardon my um, Wi-Fi delay. Um, but if it stops again, we can keep going. Um, Absolutely no problem. So today's talk um, or the evening um, that we're gathered here for is going to focus on structural racism. And I'll talk about um, what that means in a place like Ghana um, and possibly how it impacts global health dynamics. Um, what this means for intellectual property, big pharma trade agreements that prevent the global south from having access to life-saving uh, me medicines and uh, treatments. For example, in sickle cell disease with hydroxyurea or gene uh, therapy or gene uh, editing, um, and now more recently, just um, just the stem cell treatments that kind of help a uh, more of these treatments in terms of um, genetics and genomics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the international debt ceiling and how these atrocities and structural adjustments are imposed by the Global North and how these IMF budget cuts um, impact us at the worldwide uh, dynamic um, at the national level and also at the local level. Specifically in Ghana with the local um, loan restructuring process. And Ghanaians um, have been in this serious dilemma with trying to understand, trying to understand, and also grapple with the the bailout, as well as um, just basically having uh, access to uh, monies and funding for to support their everyday needs. This is very much catered around the U.S. dollar and how the U.S. dollar kind of controls every single detail of human life here on the ground. And I could give you a few examples of that. But just for starters, I'll let you um, just remind you that Ghana, um, Ghana received this independence March 6, 1957. And since then, it has um, applied for IMF bailout program at 17 times since uh, more than six decades since its independence. Um, according to the BBC News, uh, Ghana, um, as we know, is one of the world's largest natural resource um, producers of gold and cocoa um, and uh, just a uh, tremendous land that has contributed to a lot of the natural resources of the world. Um, however, they don't really see the, the benefits of those natural resources um, due to exploitation, capitalism, neo-colonialism, and so forth. And this suffering has increased a lot of um, horrific challenges on the ground level um, that has placed a lot of generations um, back. And so now um, with the global pandemic of COVID-19, also the, the war um, on Ukraine, there's a lot of other injustices throughout the world that has also imposed even um, much more like uh, human suffering here um, in small countries like Ghana. Um, so Ghana's debt is at about 90% of the annual value of its economy. And it's hard, been hard to really pay for these imports that are produced and also uh, purchased and priced at the U.S. dollar rate. So the U.S. dollar, as I mentioned, controls pretty much everything um, at on the ground level, and the U.S. dollar fluctuates. So, for example, uh, my daughter goes to school here in Ghana. So if I'm paying for her tuition or paying for something, um, I'm actually paying more um, based on the Ghana 
city, um, which is roughly between uh, 10 to 15 um, to the dollar. And it is just, it can just really uh, put a dampen in just paying for any little small things such as toilet paper, medical supplies, equipment for birthing, um, just typical treatments for sickle cell pain or sickle cell crisis, cancer treatments, chemotherapy, a lot of those, um, any little type of, um, uh, if you will, just any little thing, it kind of fluctuates the imports, but also just everyday life. So what does this mean in terms of global um, structural racism and how does this impact us across the world? Um, as we are here to uh, talk about medical apartheid, um, the word apartheid, we know, comes uh, largely from South Africa, and it's uh, meaning apartness or segregation. And uh, that segregation is due to uh, skin color and phenotype um, and uh, regionality. And a lot of this is, is deeper than just um, race. Um, it is also uh, hegemonic. It is very pervasive. It is uh, sustained and supported uh, through um, religion, through laws, through policy, um, and colonialism, as we know. But these laws are still in effect uh, in, in a very hidden and sneaky way, I would say. Uh, they, they are not uh, legalized anymore, such as apartheid um, in South Africa ended in, systematically ended in 1994. But when I was in South Africa, there were still very much so um, this shadow of its, its, its um, uh, existence and still on the ground. So applying that concept of uh, apartheid from South Africa to medical apartheid, and what does this mean to kind of divide us up across different uh, funding allocations for diseases, also uh, clinical trials, or how medicines are distributed across the world, um, imposed from the global north and the global south, and these IMF uh, programs that many countries are struggling to just continue to keep their um, economy above water. Um, this has really, um, divided up the world in such a way that it makes it impossible to compete with the U.S. on a global scale. And it also um, makes it impossible to continue to fund local economies that are considered low, middle, and income, um, even at the local level. So right now, I'm currently writing an anthology with one of my collaborators from Peru, and we're writing an anthology book on decolonializing global health. And so for me, and a lot of my work uh, talks about uh, these types of atrocities, but um, how do we do the work to decolonialize this at every single level uh, um, at the, across the board? And just picking out one of these, um, medical apartheid, intergenerational racial trauma and how this is not just a one-time stamp, but it is something that is deeply historical and we can't disconnect it from our colonial past. We cannot continue to ignore the, the history that has made a lot of this pervasive um, and deeply um, still present. <laughs> and so um, moving through that, um, when we think about outrages and police brutality and the killings in the US, such as George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, and I speak their names, um, we see the US on this global scale throughout the world and how the media has also um, kind of controlled the narrative of uh, and shaped how we see uh, not only black life, but all lives in, in the US, but uh, is in a sense, to contextualize this, um, this is happening uh, in every part of the world. There's George Floyd's in Brazil, uh, in, in Ghana, uh, in uh, Jamaica. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that race has um, played out in different parts of the world and has showed up and are hidden from the overall media format. And in speaking in terms of medicine, um, this is systemic and it is reinforced through capitalism. And it's also a tool and a tactic to continue to control how we see um, persons of color um, 
who are in, who are proximate to whiteness or um, who are um, connected to um, African ancestry um, uh, throughout the diaspora. So, uh, okay, I, I'm getting one more minute here signal. So to just kind of wrap some of this up, what does this mean for me as an African-American woman, as a Black scholar uh, coming from the U.S. and now based here in Ghana? We just had our year of return. Um, so for me, it is a large part of my, my work to return to Ghana to do science differently, to help deconstruct and demystify a lot of what's going on with medical apartheid, but also to decolonialize this idea of global um, health dynamics. But deeper for me, it is a personal connection. Um, my grandmother worked on a sharecropping farm in the South. Um, she only had a seventh grade education. She uh, picked hand, picked cotton with her bare hands. And I remember um, when I went back to her homeland in rural Georgia, and I, I went to the cotton fields, and I stood there, and I just could imagine uh, the, there being acres and acres of, of, of my people. Um, just stand um, out there from sun up to sundown, denied education, denied health care rights, denied um, pretty much humanity. And um, my grandmother was one of those people. My grandfather, um, his um, his his entire lineage is from the Thomas plantation. Hence, my last name is Thomas because the owner of the plantation was a Thomas. His his he was a Thomas. Um, a master um, at the time. And so um, coming to Ghana, and I'll close here, um, I remember going to the door of no return. And I stood in the center of the door um, where the slaves were, or the enslaved was uh, stored in the slave dungeons on the West Coast and of, of Africa in Ghana before they were transported to the slave ships and carried over. And a lot of those slave ships were named Jesus grace of God, liberty and justice. And there was a priest and a preacher who would stand on the slave ships and pray for, um, for the journey. It was, it's horrific um, to even just stand there. But to be a scholar who has stood on both sides and cried on both lands, on both soils, and have seen how um, the privileges that come with being an American, but also denied um, because of the color of my skin, uh, it has really shattered um, all of my identities and has really shaken up a lot of how um, I even see myself now. I don't just see myself, I see myself as a Black woman, but I see myself as a woman of the world who is African. And that is very important for me to have that type of stamp and my own personhood, my own um, stamp in my freedom. So I'll end there. Um, I didn't have much time and I had quite a few notes, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse and an overview of the talk, but also add in the personal dynamic of what does it mean to do this work and not just talk about this work. Um, sometimes we have to face and grapple with the lived experiences of our own ancestors, stand on the soils that they stood on, and allow those, um, those ancestors to guide our research questions and our research processes to reach all the way to policy and laws um, throughout, the, throughout the world. So um, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, so deeply honored and moved to um, kind of share some of these complexities and challenges with you um, personally, as well as scholarly. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. I feel I got a shiver up the back of my spine as I realized you were calling in our ancestors from both sides of the Atlantic to be present, to witness. And it was not um, by accident that I talked about these policies having their knee on the neck of the global South so that we could really connect the kinds of structural racisms that allow for police brutality on the ground and the slow unfolding death of one black person that we're also watching these slow unfolding deaths of whole communities and populations in regions of the world because of the exact dynamics that we're here to talk about. So thank you for that beautiful introduction that brought us to the ground. It felt sacred. Um, I'm going to introduce our next 
speakers. Hilma Nakambali is a graduate student, a PhD student in the Department of Epidemiology in the Department of Global Health, who will be um, the interlocutor with Dr. Maza Sayum. Dr. Sayum is an Ethiopian feminist who's been working in the field of global health for close to two decades. She's currently a senior advisor for alliances and strategic partnerships at Oxfam in the US, where she works with a multi multidisciplinary team to advance economic and racial justice as part of movement in the US and worldwide. Um, the bio goes on for much more, but I will let you jump in and talk about what you do. Welcome, Kilma and Dr. Siyum. Thank you so much, Rachel. Before Hilma goes on, I just want to say that you have promoted me to doctor. I do not have a PhD <laughs> and I will, I will take the love, but I am not a, a doctor. So I just want to note that for the record, but thank you for the promotion, Rachel. <laughs> you're welcome. It was free and you're definitely a professor. So prophesize. Thank you. He'll, should I go ahead and, and get started and then he'll, we'll have a discussion? Okay, well, thank you yeah. so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Thomas, for guiding us in to that dis the discussion in, in, such a, in such a moving way. It's such an honor to be here. I was a student of public health myself many years ago, um, and I am envious and also really hopeful for the next generation that you all get to have these types of discussions set up for you by your university, because I would have loved to have more of this when I was a student um, many years ago. So it just makes me so happy to see this generation benefiting from the guidance of elders who really care about this type of diversity and bringing voices from, from all over the world. It's also an honor to be here um, on Africa Day, um, which you know today is March 25th, uh, 1963, was the first meeting of what ended up being the African Union in the city of my birth in, in Addis Ababa. And Kwame Nkrumah was there from, from Ghana and was one of the one of the, the primary leaders who was there with Hala Selassie 60 years ago. So you know, as I thought about this meeting today, I was thinking about, you know, the hopefulness of that moment, you know, the solidarity and the inspiration that came from these leaders, from these newly independent countries really trying to form this kind of solidarity and, and unity. And I know that now as we think about, um, you know, what, what Dr. Thomas has touched on, and as well, um, Dr. Chapman, you know, this situation that we're in where low-income countries are spending four times more on debt than they are on health, and on average in 2021, low-income countries um, spent more than 25% of their budgets on interest and debt repayments. You know, So this was probably not the future that our leaders had in mind 60 years ago, but at the same time, I think um, kind of reflecting on the moment of inspiration and this day of solidarity and you know, taking hopefully being able to, to take that with us. Um, I'm also very excited that this is the first event I am in for my new job at Oxfam in the U.S., but I still get to be here with a comrade of mine from the People's Vaccine Alliance work, Arthur. It's great to, to see Arthur here. We worked on so many things together in terms of um, intellectual property rights. And of course, Aldo, who's a new comrade who I met at um, one of my first meetings at Oxfam. So it's really lovely the way that all of our, our work is, um, is intersecting here. I'll just give a, a brief, brief um, intro um, about the People's Vaccine Alliance, where I was. It's a place I love and I think very highly of. I know that many of you probably have heard of Oxfam. You know, it's been around for 80 years, you know, works with a coalition of many, many organizations. Um, the People's Vaccine Alliance might be newer to most people. So I'll just give a brief intro on that. And I hope we'll get to talk a little bit more about the work of the People's Vaccine Alliance. But the PVA um, was started almost exactly three years ago today, um, started with an open letter that was written to health leaders that were attending the World Health Assembly in Geneva. It's a meeting that takes place every year. And it was a letter written by people who had worked on the HIV pandemic and remembered you know, that period when treatment was available in the global north and not in the global south. And we're really encouraging health leaders 
to not make the same mistakes with COVID that they had made with HIV. So this letter was written even before the first COVID vaccines were effective, you know, were found to be effective and safe, but was really looking forward to that moment and saying, let's not make the same mistakes we made then. Of course, the same mistakes were made and we'll talk um, a little bit more about that. But what has happened is that the People's Vaccine Alliance has spent then the, you know, the last three years um, conducting advocacy, developing campaigns, working with a global alliance of about 100 organizations to push back um, against you know, the intellectual property rules that made it such that um, people in the global south were not able to access vaccines and then eventually also tests and treatments against COVID-19. Um, what, you know, and I hope that Hilma, you and I can talk a little bit more about that, but that's really, you know, the, the groundwork that laid, um, the, that laid the setup of the People's Vaccine Alliance. And now, as, as um, Dr. Chapman has said, you know, in my new role at Oxfam, some of what is exciting about Oxfam is that it's an organization that works on health, but through all these affiliates is also able to touch on issues of debt relief, um, economic justice, you know, racial equality in a much broader sense. So um, I'm happy to be able to bring some of my old work and things that I'm very passionate about into, into the new work as well. So thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. Yeah, thank you, Maaza. And I'm really delighted to be speaking to you this evening. And I like the work that you've done at the Vaccine Alliance. I really appreciate that you've been a good advocate for the Global South. So you, you mentioned that the global response to COVID-19 pandemic was reminiscent of what the world saw during the height of the HIV pandemic. Could you talk more about that? Yes, yes, Hilma. So, you know, as, as I said, you know, that first letter at the People's Vaccine Alliance that started the movement really was encouraging leaders to not make the same mistakes that were made before. And I think it's worth reminding, I know you all, there are many public health students here and public health professors, but for people who maybe work in other fields, it's worth kind of remembering where we were and, you know, what that situation was like, you know, 30 years ago. Um, just as a refresher, you know, highly effective treatment for HIV was available in the global north in rich countries, probably as of 1995. It took another 10 years to reach the areas of the world that were hardest hit by HIV. And I think, you know, it's fair to say that during that period, um, most African families, especially those in East and Southern Africa, were affected by HIV. In my own family, three of my cousins died in that period when treatment was not available, you know, and was essentially a death sentence to, to be HIV positive. Whereas in parts of the global North, people were living kind of, you know, as a chronic disease um, with, with HIV. And, you know, um, the medications were too expensive for most African countries and pharmaceutical companies fought really tooth and nail to prevent low income countries from being able to access, you know, cheaper generics. And, you know, Dr. Thomas speaks about South Africa um, in 1998, 40 pharmaceutical companies took the South African government to court to stop it from being able to import generic drugs from Brazil and India. Um, and, you know, this was during a period when South Africa was really struggling under the strain of, of HIV with tens of thousands of people dying every year. But it was also a time, you know, when South Africa was really kind of the hope of the world. So, the, you know, to think about like the hubris and the gall, you know, of these pharmaceutical companies, you know, Nelson Mandela had just won the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, he had just been elected as the first legitimate president of South Africa. And despite all of that, the fact that they, you know, felt really emboldened to be able to sue South Africa to prevent it from accessing um, uh, the HIV treatment. And really the idea was that, you know, just reflecting on whose lives matter, you know, that those people's lives didn't matter. You know, Black people, poor people, people who were named to be, you know, promiscuous, like what do their lives matter? And it essentially, you know, at the end, it was shame that sort of changed this. And I know we often say, and, you know, Arthur, we used to say at the People's Vaccine Alliance, like, how do we actually shame the shameless? You know, like, it's often very hard to, to shame them, but it was really shame um, that eventually turned the tide. And, you know, activists all around the world, even during a period, in a period when social media was not available, which I think is probably hard for some of the younger ones here to imagine, you know, now we have 
Twitter and Instagram and other things that allow us to reach people all around the world. But despite that, activists were really able to, to gather and, and to shame the shameless. But one thing I want to point out, and I know that Arthur has done a lot of work on you know, trade um, that has to do with the US government. It's important to remind people what the US government's stance was at that time, which is also reminiscent to me. You know, There's the corporate power part, but it's also the US government um, you know, the head of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and I think it's important to say his name to try and shame him, even though he is still a professor of international development at, at university in Texas now. But in 2021 or 2022, um, 20, 20, 2001, Andrew Nastios, who was then the head of the U.S. Agency for International Development, when people were trying to decide whether treatment should be rolled out to Africa, had the nerve to sit in a room in public and say that it was not worth providing Africans with treatment for HIV because, and I quote here, he said, Africans that we didn't know what Western time was and we would not be able to adhere to our treatments. He said, many people in Africa have never seen a clock or a watch in their entire lives. If you say one in the afternoon, they don't know what you're talking about. And this is now, we're talking in 2001, we're not talking, you know, 1943. In 2001, here the head of the, the US Agency for International Development was saying that it was not worth providing us with treatment because we didn't know how to tell time and we wouldn't be able to adhere to our treatment. He eventually you know, apologized and said he hadn't meant to offend anyone, but this is just a reminder that you know, racism is not just about prejudice. It's about a system that is weaponized and kills people. You know, so for him to say he didn't mean to offend anyone and eventually, you know, treatment, the U.S. government did support a very large treatment program and African countries, South Africa had one of the largest treatment programs in the world. I worked in, South, in Rwanda for a while and I remember my U.S. colleagues being shocked at the level of ad adherence that the patients in Rwanda had to treatment, you know. So that's another kind of reminiscent thing is that um, we even heard, you know, at that time, people were saying Africans are not going to be able to adhere to their treatment. We did hear during the COVID-19 pandemic when vaccines were not being rolled out, the CEO of Pfizer saying that Africans were vaccine hesitant and that we were anti-science and would not, you know, adhere to our vaccination regimens, which again, you know, was reminiscent to me and was also complete nonsense. You know, vaccine hesitancy is everywhere, but no evidence to show that it's more in Liberia than it is in Arkansas or in Austria, right? So, you know, this idea that, you know, Africans are not are not going to, um, to take vaccines. So there's a hesitancy argument, there's the not being able to adhere. And, you know, um, and I don't wanna go on too long, but I'll just say, you know, one other thing that is very reminiscent is the amount of money that was, that was made, you know, um, in COVID-19, we saw so much money provided by the US government um, for for the development of vaccines. And during that time, you know, the there have been six, at least six billionaires that have um, developed, you know, made their fortunes through the COVID-19 vaccines. The CEO of Moderna made $400 million last year. And during this time, still refusing to share technology. Another racist trope is that, you know, Global South countries are not able to make these products. Um, so those are just some of the ways that, you know, what we suffered during the HIV pandemic and with, you know, the estimate of 12 million people who died because of a lack of access to treatment at that time, you know, we've seen that same, you know, the, the deaths that we saw in 2021 during that period when vaccines were not available, the science journal Nature has estimated um, that 1.3 million people would have been able to live if those vaccines had been rolled out in a way that was equitable. And that's about 24, one person every 24 seconds. So if you were to think about that, that's during this webinar, a 90 minute webinar, 225 people dying. That's sort of the, you know, the numbers that we're talking about um, during that period. So again, the number of deaths being, you know, reminiscent in terms of the, the deaths that could have been avoided had the medical care been rolled out the way it should have been. Yeah, um, you've really framed the medical apartheid very well around HIV. And it's interesting that you've highlighted the work of the treatment action campaign in South Africa that was really at the at the height of HIV was really a good advocate for people living with HIV. And it just goes on to show what advocacy can do for, you know, people in the global south. Um, I'd love to move on and talk about um, the WHO declared the end of the COVID-19 pandemic earlier this month, 
However, we know that approximately uh, 2.3 billion individuals globally have not even received one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And, and as we prepare for future pandemics, we are aware that barriers such as intellectual property rights restrictions, especially in the global south, can still lead to loss of lives. Um, what can we do differently to address intellectual property rights restrictions in future pandemics and to ensure equitable access to life-saving interventions such as the COVID-19, especially in the global south? Could you speak to that? Yes, I can speak a little bit about the, the pandemic accord that is currently being developed, but I'm assuming that Arthur will be speaking a little bit more about the kind of trade rules. You know, we worked quite a bit on the, the TRIPS agreement, um, which was would hopefully would have alleviated some of the IP, the intellectual property restrictions um, for COVID vaccines and tests and treatments. That's something that we worked extensively on, and we were not able to push um, over the over the line. Um, and I know that, you know, Arthur will be speaking a little bit more about that because that battle still continues. Um, but the pandemic accord is now being negotiated, um, you know, by, by the World Health Organization and, and member countries. One thing that I do want to say is that, you know, the negotiations at the World Trade Organization, uh, the fact that there were, you know, two Global South countries that put through the proposal for the TRIPS waiver, that 100 countries, you know, signed onto it and that it was still blocked by rich European and North American countries, again, goes to show, you know, here you can have 100 countries saying, yes, we think this is important, and then a few rich countries um, saying no, and the U.S. being one of the ones that, you know, initially, you know, uh, accepted a certain part of the waiver, but then, you know, would not go all the way for, for tests and treatments. Um, so um, so I want to there are a few things in terms of the, the pandemic treaty um, that the PVA, the People's Vaccine Alliance, is really pushing for just about um, medical technologies um, really being seen as global common goods and the advocacy needed around that. And that again, you know, and Dr. Chapman has has referred to this, the fact that, you know, these must, that people's lives must take precedence over profit, the investment in countries' public health systems, you know, it's not only unethical and racist, but it's foolish to not protect people against, you know, diseases that can easily spread from one person in one country to another, and also um, really financing pandemic preparedness in a meaningful way. So there are, those are the things that I think we all have to advocate for and to really push our governments to support. Um, but I'll stop there because I know that we have two other amazing speakers and hopefully we can come back for more questions later. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you so much, Marisa. Hilma, 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 sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both so much for that really lively introduction to this thread of the braid that we're building today. And I also wanted to connect that back for those of you who are at the Winner Takes All forum with Anand Jiridharadas, that the paradox uh, and the unseemly, the shamelessness of having racist discourses being propagated by the very same people while they're covering up shameless profiteering that also creates the context in which the richest people in the world get to enter the scene, enter the stage as do-gooders while they're still making money at the same time. So that's a great bridge to bring in in terms of debt and profit to bring in our next speaker and their interlocutor. Um, Aldo Cagliari is a senior director of policy and strategy. He served as the senior advisor at the Intergovernmental Group of 24 on the International on International Monetary Affairs and Development from 27 to 2020. There's so much more to say about you, um, Aldo, but you're here to talk with us about Jubilee USA and um, debt justice activism. I um, welcome Ravi Yasuna, an alum of the Department of, uh, Department of Global Health and also a teaching, I don't know the exact, um, you can introduce yourself to say the exact name of your teaching and research position here in the department. Welcome both of you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, and welcome Aldo Cagliari. Uh, my name is Rabi. I am an assistant teaching professor in the departments of global health and in health systems and population health. And, you know, I'm just so honored that you're here with us today. Um, my teaching um, 
involves me interacting with a lot of undergraduate students, but also graduate students. And I try to put in a lot of different perspectives on global health and anti-racism and equity. So trying to break it down for students because we just throw these words around and they don't know what we mean. So many of my students are actually on this webinar today. So I am, um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to meet you. Uh, and uh, also thank you to the University of Washington for putting together this uh, amazing event with so many uh, uh, great advocates and, and great uh, scholars. And I've just enjoyed uh, every bit so far, uh, 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 including uh, the, the, the stories that have been shared. Uh, uh, it has been uh, much more lively than many other events. <laughs> I have to attend on a daily basis, uh, so thank you. Um, and uh, so I'm here to talk uh, about Jubilee and the, uh, uh, the issues that uh, we are seeing in the world today. Uh, so first, let me say Jubilee USA is an alliance of 75 organizations and uh, 70, 750 congregations and, and faith communities around the US. And we also work with more than 50 global partners and uh, on uh, essentially on policies that serve, protect, and promote the participation of the most vulnerable, uh, economic policies, uh, and, and building an economy that, that can achieve that. And uh, we uh, uh, have in our membership the Christian churches in the United States, so from Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, but also religious uh, denominations uh, from, from a Jewish tradition and from a Muslim tradition and, uh, and, and, and all of this because uh, Jubilee, uh, for those of you who don't know, is uh, uh, it's, it's something, it's a tradition shared by all the Abrahamic religious traditions. Uh, so it's the idea of the forgiveness of debt, the renewal that needs to happen periodically. Uh, you know, it's a time to let the lands rest. Uh, it's a time to forgive debts. It's a time to uh, uh, essentially to, to, to share with others and uh, that. That's what we are trying to promote through economic policy, the, the economic policy that we advocate. And I mentioned that especially because uh, for many people, Jubilee is associated only with debt. Huh? And so uh, it is true that the Jubilee movement emerged at the call of uh, uh, initially Pope John Paul II in the 90 for the forgiveness of the debts of developing countries. But uh, for us, uh, and, and I think it's, it's common to the Jubilee movement, I would dare to say, it's uh, that is not uh, uh, a, a, it, it's a, it's a means to an end. You know, the the the, the forgiveness of debt is is not the end in itself. It's because it, debt is a symptom, and it's a symptom precisely of all these uh, uh, a, a structural uh, a, a aspects of the global economy that we have been just discussing. You know the extractivism and the profiteering and the structural inequalities and uh, and, and the, the the racial uh, also a, a, a underpinnings of that a, of, of, of that economy and, and so it, it you know that that's what the, the, the idea of debt forgiveness also a, it comes from and, and, and it's it's why we also we don't only work on debt we also work on trade and work on tax issues and a transparency and a number of other aspects of the international economic system. But going back to that, uh, so today it's, it's a very uh, a critical issue on the agenda of many countries. And uh, uh, Dr. Shamika was talking about what is happening in Ghana, which is a, a, a very uh, clear example of, of, of that. We have uh, uh, so many countries that uh, where the debt situation is critical, whether it's it can take different calculations, but uh, uh, the number is like about 60 or 70 countries that are in what we could call a debt crisis. Now you may say, I don't see so many countries are defaulting on their debts. And that is precisely part of a, a revealing fact that we have in our hands today, because a few countries are defaulting. They continue to pay that debt in spite of being in a crisis, because the costs of default are so huge that they prefer to just continue paying. So what we have is not a, 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 a default on the debt. We have a default on development. We have countries stopping to make the investment they need to be making 
on health, on education, on social protection for their people. Um, so we have reached now the same number of countries that are uh, the, the number of countries that are spending more than 20% of their budget in paying debt. Is uh, we have reached now the same number of, of, of countries that we had when the heavily indebted poor countries initiative was put in place in uh, the late 90s. This is the biggest debt relief initiative that we had. Uh, so, and there is nothing in the horizon at the moment of the size of that initiative. Um, so we're, we're, uh, it, it is a very, uh, a very critical situation because of that. We don't see the, the, the movement. We don't see the will to have debt forgiveness in that, uh, a, a, at that scale. But the other aspect that is uh, uh, a, a very important to highlight at this time in this type of debt crisis is that at that time, you could have, and you know, all the advocacy was focusing on the G7 because the G7 were the countries that could get together and they had the power, they had the, the claims, you know, the debt claims were theirs or in the international financial institutions that they more or less controlled and they could make those decisions. Today, we have a different type of crisis because 60% of the debt is not owed to even, even to countries, it's owed to private creditors which connects to this other issue that we were talking about, about the, the, the profit making. So these are companies that lend for a profit to countries at an interest rate that was supposed to reflect that those countries may default. And it did reflect that. So that's why the US can borrow, at, uh, it was able to borrow for a long time at near zero interest rates. But if you lend to, if you, if you are Ghana and you try to borrow, you have to pay, uh, I don't know what is in this, like 14%, 15% interest rate, right? So uh, all that is supposed to precisely cover the possibility of a default. So now, now when you have these countries going through default, the creditors say, uh, you know, we are not going to provide that relief because, uh, the, the, you know, imagine if we had to provide that relief, uh, the, it, the risk we have to reflect in an interest rate. And, and then we say, but uh, the interest rates were already reflecting that. So what are you talking about? <laughs> but th this is the, the situation today. We have 60% of the debt in the hands of private creditors. And this is a, 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 a different type of, of approach that we need because we need to get those private creditors to contribute their share of debt relief. No? So even though the public creditors are uh, uh, a, already setting in place programs to forgive the debt, the private creditors are not contributing their share. So uh, one very important initiative we are taking now, we are very proud to be partnering with Oxfam and, and many others on that, uh, and, and uh, uh, the University of Washington is also kindly helping and, and supporting this campaign is uh, half of the debt contracts with those private creditors, the, the applicable law is here in the US, actually one state, the state of New York. Those bonds, those contracts say that the, the, the law that, that rules those contracts is the, the legislation of the state of New York. So we are trying to reform the legislation of the state of New York. So if a creditor tries to go and sue in the court to get payment, the judge will stop that creditor and say, okay, you can get paid, but only up to the proportion that this international debt relief initiative said that you can get paid. So if the public creditors are providing 50% debt relief, the private creditor also cannot receive more than 50%. And that, that, that's essentially the, the idea behind this legislation. Uh, we have now a broad coalition of uh, uh, religious leaders, labor, this is the whole, the AFL-CIO, the AFS-CME, uh, the Public Employee Federation of New York, and also development organizations, and there is Oxfam, but there's also the One Campaign, Bread for the World, uh, and the diaspora organizations. You no, know, uh, uh, we have we have a, a very broad coalition that is promoting this uh, legislation in New York, uh, and, and it's a, uh, a it, it could really be a game changer because it could be the first time that we actually have. Actually, it's not the first time. This uh, this is a legislation that in the UK, when the heavily indebted poor countries initiative was in place, uh, even though the, the, you know, at, at that time, the proportion of private creditors was, was smaller, but there were still some of these private creditors going and suing the countries in court to get paid their full claim. And that's what the legislation stopped. And we are trying, we have building on that legislation, we are trying to have that 
in New York now apply to the current debt relief initiatives, but also to future debt relief initiatives that Dr. Are, Calieri, may come to pass. Okay. Bringing you back to um, this particular issue, because we do know that you know, time and time again, the way that African nations have been treated when they have debt are different when it's, you know, as they are servicing their debt is very different from how, for example, say Greece or Ireland or Portugal was treated when they were having their own debt crisis post the 2008. So now that you're talking about these things, um, the New York state law, you know, the Senate bill and the, the act, you know them very well. It looks like they are going to, in future, kind of help with our anti-racist agenda of saying, you know, because more African nations are in debt. So if this is getting better, then, you know, it's kind of anti-racist. But I, I just want to know, are people being explicit about a reason for doing these things, some of the reasons for doing these things to be, we're doing this for anti-racist reasons. So I'm asking you, I, I did see very clearly that Jubilee USA had a lot of faith, you know, tied to it, the three Abrahamic religions, the big ones, you know, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And it was then the website, it was very strange for, for me to see that kind of coalition, but I'm happy to see it. But is that, is religion uniting more of the coalition or is, are you getting support when you say we're doing these for anti-racist reasons? Because I didn't see like explicit reason. I'm not criticizing the work. I am so happy with the work, but I just want to know what is the landscape out there? What are you seeing? So um, I, I, I think uh, it, it's a, a something, it's part of the Jubilee call. Like I said, this structural inequality that we are trying to address, they have a, a racial underlining, uh, a, a, you know, they, they, they have a racial basis. Um, I think the way uh, the anti-racism comes more uh, uh, clearly in our campaign is the way we work. So um, we work, as I said, with partners around the world. And these partners are uh, in Latin America, which is my uh, background, but also in Africa, in Asia, in Puerto Rico, even in the Caribbean. And the way we work um, is not only that we work closely with them, or what we we are promoting and what we need to say and what, you know, all all the messaging, but also uh, you see that oftentimes uh, we have events where Jubilee is the sponsor and the Jubilee is organizer, but we are not there. You know, we are not there on the panel. And why we are not there? Because uh, we are letting the space be occupied by the people who are affected. So we want we create the platforms for our partners from Africa, from Latin America, from the Caribbean. So um, you see that it's a constant in our campaign. So, you know, we work together with our partners in the Caribbean to build something called Jubilee Caribbean years ago. Uh, uh, we are working with our partners in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has legislation that uh, uh, we passed on a bipartisan basis that actually provided a bankruptcy system. Puerto Rico didn't have one until 2016. Now it has one, uh, and, and it's a process in which it, it was able to achieve more than half, per, more, more than half of, it, of its debt was was uh, uh, for uh, 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 cut. Uh, so, but you know the way we do that is to, to provide a platform for them to speak. And so we are working with our partners in Africa, which are also religious leaders in Africa. And I was just uh, with them in, in, in meetings last week. We had statements. We 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 have. Um, uh, you know, we, we broke uh, working with the uh, religious organizations in Italy. We brought religious leaders from Africa to talk to the decision makers in Italy, which will hold the chair of the G7 next year. You know? uh, so the same way we also have brought them to talk here at the U in the U.S. with treasury officials. You know? So we try to use uh, uh, our influence to essentially create those platforms for people to represent themselves in those spaces uh, and so and I, I could bring many examples but I think that is uh, uh, I think uh, the, the way we, we reflect so we we may not say so much about uh, 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 anti-racism uh, in you know in, in terms of the the, the, the language but uh, I think it our behavior shows it and, and that's you know in, in the way we work with our colleagues and partners around the world that's how how we embody that in our in our work.
Thank you. Thank you both so much uh, for that. And Ravi, that was a very stealth uh, question. And to really think, I hope, with our students about how that could be an opening for conversations about race in faith communities that are not happening right now. And to tie it to, to Jubilee, what a beautiful concept. Thank you so much. I'm going, um, Aldo, thank you so much for bringing this global perspective and for hopefully inspiring lots of people to get involved with this work. Thanks and to the you. way in which we can hear to support and what's I'm going not on. a doctor. I also wanted to just say Oh, that. okay. Thank you. <laughs> there are going to, going to be links to the work that Jubilee is doing, especially this work, legislative work in uh, New York. So I'm so glad to be giving out free degrees here. I'm going to introduce our last two um, pair of speakers. Arthur Stamulis is the executive director of Citizens Trade Campaign, a US-based coalition of organizations working to improve international trade policy. He started in trade organizing after participating in the 1999 battle in Seattle, where he was inspired by the power of cross-sector, cross-border, coalition building. Um, welcome, Arthur, and your interlocutor is our newest uh, professor here in the Department of Global Health, um, Professor Ferdinand Mukambang. Welcome, both of you. And I'll just hand it to Arthur, if that's okay, and Ferdinand, you'll have your questions ready. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so again, uh, I work with Citizens Trade Campaign, which is the national coalition of labor, environmental, family, farm, faith, and consumer groups um, working to stop harmful corporate-driven trade agreements, to try to promote a positive vision for international trade. Um, we work very closely with Julie at the Washington Fair Trade Coalition, and as Maza mentioned, we're also a member of the People's Vaccine Alliance. Uh, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, one of the many problems with existing trade pacts is that they require countries to prioritize the interests of pharmaceutical monopolies over public health. Um, so, you know, Maz already explained that, you know, right out of the gate, that cost lives, um, that prioritization of corporate profits, pharmaceutical profits over access to medicine. And obviously in recent years where we've seen this is that um, it led to a situation in which the production of COVID vaccines, tests, treatments has been intentionally stifled. Uh, and just huge numbers of people in low and middle income countries have had to go without access to medical goods uh, that many Americans take for granted. And, you know, we all know as a result, there have been huge numbers of avoidable deaths in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, um, really impossible to know how many deaths would have been avoided were it not for these monopoly protections, uh, but the number is likely in the millions. Uh, and it's also impossible to know, you know, if we if we could have even stopped the wave after wave of COVID variants if it were not for these monopoly protections. But, you know, some of the, some of the variants may also have been preventable. And so in this context, um, CTC tried very hard to get an immediate waiver of the trade rules standing in the way of access to COVID medications. Um, there is an agreement under the World Trade Organization called the Agreement on Trade and Intellectual Property Rights, TRIPS. So, you know, you, people may have heard talk of the TRIPS waiver. That's what we were fighting with, with, with PBA, with Washington Fair Trade, with, you know, literally thousands of organizations across the world <laughs> pushing for a TRIPS waiver. Um, and at the same time, we also tried to indict the system of trade deals that prioritize pharmaceutical monopolies in the first place. Like we want both an emergency waiver of the messed up trade rules now, but we also want to transform the rules for the long haul um, so that we're not continually in this, <laughs> this situation again and again and again. So that, that's who we are and what we're about. Um. Thank you so much, Arthur. Um, this is really a very nice introduction into what you have been saying. So I think that um, during the COVID period, um, I was in South Africa. I think that especially when the vaccine um, came out. And so 
the, one of the biggest um, problems or um, uh, factors related to hesitancy, if I may say, um, to the vaccine, because even, even though it had, um, we, we had received the news of the vaccine, but South Africans were already defiant that we are not going to take this vaccine coming from the global north. And so one of the reasons or the thing that, that they were citing is why is South Africa not producing the vaccine? Is it that we don't have the capacity to do so? Is it that we don't have scientists or um, and what in the capacity in whatever way? Why uh, why can these vaccines be manufactured here? And they, they were saying that if they are manufactured here, then we might have the propensity to take them. But it coming from the Western world, we kind of not trust it. And so in the light of that context, um, uh, we've seen now so many instances in which patent protections have impeded access to life-saving medication, including the COVID, um, 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 the, um, the COVID vaccine. And so um, could you describe for us how large pharmaceutical companies influence the rules in, in, in trade agreements around intellectual property rights and how do they lobby for world trade organizations? Um, and how do they um, uh, lobby with the US government to retain such intellectual property? Why can it not be shared with African counterparts for the production of life-saving medication? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. And I mean, just starting with a little history lesson. I mean, from World War II up until about the 1980s, um, trade agreements were more or less about, you know, the things you'd probably consider when you hear trade. Like they're about lifting quotas, lifting tariffs so that goods could be traded more freely. Um, starting in the 1980s and really ramping up in the 1990s, uh, different corporate sectors realized that they could rig trade agreements to, um, you know, get new rules implemented globally that really have very little to do with trade per se. So Wall Street oh. got language inserted into trade agreements that restrict regulations on banks and insurance companies. Big Ag and the chemical companies got language added that, that put caps on food safety standards that deregulated biotechnology. Uh, and Big Pharma put rules in place that required countries to enact and to enforce medicine patents and other pharmaceutical monopoly protections. Um, and, you know, prior to that, like, number of countries actually had no patents for pharmaceuticals like you know they actively promoted generic competition the general idea being you know let's get as many companies as possible producing medicines and then the cost will go down for people uh but since the 90s the u.s in particular has pushed very hard for trade packs to require that countries establish and enforce ip rules for big pharma um even though that means countries end up paying multiple times more for the same medications that they used to get, you know, much more affordably. When there's no competition, when there are literally government enforced monopolies over a medication, uh, prices can be twice as high, they can be 10 times higher. You know, in the case of HIV AIDS, they were literally 100 times higher. Um, mm -hmm. You know, companies can charge whatever they want. And, you know, in the United States, pharma is the most powerful lobby uh, in terms of dollars spent. If you look at elections, they are the, the sector that spends the most on elections. Um, you know, I mean, you turn on ATV, you'll see <laughs> half of the ads are for pharmaceutical companies. Like they have money, uh, <laughs> and that equates to power in the United States. And so, um, you know, you, it leads to like you know a situation where like, okay, I can understand why the U.S. or Switzerland or other countries with large pharmaceutical interests would pursue these policies, but like, why would developing countries ever agree to this? Um, and obviously, there are multiple reasons for that, but, um, you know, one important bit of context is a lot of this, these policies first got into place after the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, when, um, you know, ideologically, there was this line that the Washington consensus on, on, on economics had won, and even if you didn't believe that, and plenty of educated people did, you know, but regardless if you didn't believe, you know, what you believe, the real politic of the situation was that, you um, you know, countries didn't have the, the Soviet bloc to play off the United States anymore. And so if countries wanted the, you know, the, the support, the aid, the good favor of the United States, they had a lot less leverage than they used to. And as we just heard in the debt discussion, um, countries that wanted to borrow money 
to um, you know, build infrastructure, to develop, sometimes just to stabilize their currencies or, or even just to pay off the debts of previous colonial era governments um, had to turn to you know, US controlled <laughs> global institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, other, other big lenders. Uh, they had to implement, they had to agree to structural adjustment programs that, you know, required severe austerity measures, meaning cuts to or privatization of social services like health services, water services, sanitation. Um, and they had to accept all sorts of neoliberal reforms, including the intellectual property regimes that were being pushed by, by Washington on behalf of Big Pharma. So, you know, that's how we got into this situation. And that's, that's how we stay in this situation. <laughs> until you know we build enough power to overcome it yeah another interesting question i'd like to ask you is um uh, with the establishment of all these um, um, of all these treaties um uh, is it possible that um countries of the global south can just defy these trade agreements and decide to produce their own medical products at reduced prices um could you break down um down that for us yeah i i mean I think that's the hope, right? That that the countries like you know, with the mRNA vaccine hub in Africa, like a lot of the work being done in India, um, that that countries will start producing and regions will start producing their own um, their own mRNA vaccines and other medical technologies um, in a much bigger way. I mean, as, as Maza referenced, as you you know, you've hinted at. Um, one of the big racist tropes being pushed by big pharma throughout the TRIPS waiver campaign is like, oh, you know, African countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries, they don't, you know, they don't have the high technology, you know, required to produce mRNA vaccines. Maybe they can produce some medicines, like, you know, maybe they can do some fill and finish where we ship them <laughs> The products and then they put them into the bottles but th they can't produce them themselves um you know it's bs like <laughs> not only do we know that that just doesn't sit right but you know there are factories and facilities in every region of the world that are capable of making mrna vaccines what what they're not capable of doing at this point is overcoming the patents <laughs> uh you know the monopoly protections that the us and that the eu and, and other global north countries are using these trade deals to force them to enforce um i think one of the the small victories that we did win at a, out of the trips waiver campaign in the united states is that the biden administration for the first time ever um said that uh it will allow it will respect the rights of other nations to exercise the full range of existing TRIPS uh, flexibilities such as Articles 30, 31, and 31 BIS and the Doha Declaration, uh, which is a bunch of trade jargon that is not going to mean much to many people, but, you know, is a signal that the United States for the first time ever um, is saying, hey, countries can issue compulsory licenses to produce medicines during health emergencies. Um, you know, it's up to campaigners, it's up to governments in the global south to actually take advantage of that opening. Um, it doesn't mean the EU isn't going to attack them, but at least the Biden administration is signaling, hey, we're not going to attack you like we used to. Um, mm. Another thing just worth pointing out is that um, right now the United States has, has just proposed a major trade agreement. Uh, that has no monopoly protections for pharmaceutical companies whatsoever. It's the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF. Uh, it's poised to set rules governing 40% of the global economy and then to become um, the template for subsequent PACs in the Americas, with Kenya, with other countries. Um, and there are, there are no IP protections for big pharma. For the first time in my mm -hmm. lifetime, the U.S. is proposing a trade deal that doesn't have that. And that's the direct result of the global campaign um, to wow. get a trip through it. So, um, you know, things are shifting, but they're not shifting quickly enough. Thank you so much, Arthur. This was really, really exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur and Ferdy. That was incredible. And if you're not convinced that all of these four things must be integrated to answer, any of the complicated questions, I think this, this panel has done a great job of creating those connections. Thank you so much, everyone. We have a short time for, for questions, and I'm going to hand it. 
we're, we're, we're going to go a little bit past seven. So if you want to stay and ask your question, please drop it into the chat. And am I, I'm handing it over to James Pfeiffer to field some questions. Please feel free to raise your hand um, or to drop a question in the chat. But once again, come off mute and thank all of our participants in case we lose them to Wi-Fi or their evenings in other countries and other places. Come off Wi-Fi, make some noise. I mean, come off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi, everyone. Um, thanks to the panelists for a really stimulating talk. We tried to get through a lot of material there. Um, we wanted to, we, we can stick around after seven. We encourage people, we want to have a few minutes for some open Q&A. And then we have a bit of a call to action with some specific links for how people can join uh, the activist work that Arthur and Aldo and um, Maga have been organizing. So want to, I think we don't actually have a lot of questions in the chat, and I want to encourage people to raise their hand and we'll just ask you to, you, um, we'll just ask you to unmute and, and uh, articulate your questions. So does anybody have some questions? Just raise your hand. We should be able to see you. There any hands Cyril up. Clement. Cyril, you're a familiar face to me, a student from a, a, a global health course. Take it away, Cyril. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. I, oh, Letty, I still can't hear you. Letty, no, it's Letty's problem. Letty needs to put... Uh, Letty, I think you need to unmute Cyril. Are you able to do that? I think he should be unmuted. Um, can you hear me? Okay. okay, I'm hearing you. I don't think anyone um, else is. Yes, I can hear him. Okay. We see you, but we can't hear you. Talk. <laughs> yep, I can um, hear him. Yeah, I'll, I'll just continue then. Um, I, I just want to thank all of you for the wonderful talks. I really learned a lot. Buddy, are you able to unmute Cyril? Here's another James, idea, I think Cyril. Everyone Type else can hear chat. him. And uh, I can repeat your question. For some reason, we're we're not here being able to hear you. And I'm, is it on your computer or on our computer? James, I think everyone else can hear him. Oh, Do you have your volume on? Sound is off. Oh. <laughs> I think we can hear you, Cyril. Go for it. Perfect. Um, so my question was mainly focused on e-dollarization, kind of getting trade deals to be done in local currencies rather than depending on the U.S. dollar and all its fluctuations. Um, but from my understanding, most of most e-dollarization efforts are kind of led by U.S. I mean, by Russia and China. So I would just Kind of wondering what your thoughts on e-dollarizing in local currency, especially currencies in the global south, would look like. What steps would countries have to take to ensure that would happen, and whether that's something international economic organizations can help with, or whether they should just kind of get out of the picture. Okay. Definitely. James, who's that directing to? To say who would who would like to answer that one? To either Arthur or Maza, any thoughts? Uh, you know, I'll say I, I don't have a lot of expertise in that. Um, I my deep suspicion is that existing international organizations uh, would not be helpful. Um, they're they're very much dominated by the global north, um, and you know, ostensibly working by consensus. So. Um, the, uh, the thought that, that the U.S. and the EU would, you know, sign off on stuff, I'm skeptical. Um, I think that was, would have to be, you know, start with local and regional initiatives and sort of work from there. But again, it's not something I've worked on directly. Uh, we have a question from Nadia Popovici. 
Um, can you come off mute, Nadia? Hi, can, ever, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, um, please excuse me if I'm jumping ahead here because I know we're gonna have a call to action later, but um, of, of what we learned today, uh, I'm, I'm a medical student and I'm wondering if you could give some suggestions on how we can apply what we learned today to a, a patient base that may be in Washington, because um, I know there's probably a lot um, of nuances as we go abroad and of course being respectful, but um, you know, with a, a big immigrant population here uh, and, and of course people just with a lot of cultural history. Um, so Nadia, are you saying in terms of providing services to the immigrant population in in the Seattle area? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what other people in in the room, you know, think that have the Seattle expertise. I mean, I think for the work that that um, that Arthur and I have been doing historically with this access to vaccines, treatments, and tests, it's really been, on the international basis, but as you know, Dr. Thomas mentioned early on, some of that racism and disparity that we see is between countries, but also within countries. You know, we have seen that you know Black Brazilians are one and a half times or were one and a half times more likely to die of COVID than White Brazilians. You know, I think some of those same figures were seen in the United States in terms of access to care and and outcomes. So that um, I think is, you know, I think the people in, that you have in the room here in terms of providing services in a culturally competent way and also being able to address the structural issues that are faced not only globally, but within countries and, and cities. So I know that that's not a very specific answer, but I think recognizing that those disparities that we talk about at international level also exist locally is, is important. I, I I wanted to just jump in for a quick moment. That's such a good question, Nadia. And I really was just hoping that we didn't say specifically, but when we talk about whether you say third world, global south, um, developing countries, there are those conditions in pockets everywhere across the United States and the same kinds of debts have been created and the same kind of reparations are needed. So to the extent that we're working with communities um, that have don't have access to healthcare, really fighting for those communities to, to get access and to get support and to even get debt forgiveness for the kinds of uh, indebtedness that happens from just seeking healthcare in the United States. It should really be part of, I think, the provision of healthcare. It, it would be unethical to try to just to get people to have to pay access to healthcare that they can't afford, right? So thank you for that question. And if you work in that in those populations, that's an important part of the advocacy that I think we're trying to do here in Washington. So thank you for the question. And I think Zachary had a great question. Yeah, hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm seeing nods. So uh, I just wanted to know, uh, mm -hmm. since we're in the belly of the beast, there's all sorts of restrictions here amongst uh, Americans in the, um, you know, in, in the United States uh, for organizing and whatnot. And I wanted to know if there's any sort of organizations that we can become a part of or get involved with uh, that will lead us in a more anti-imperialist direction that will help support um, the decolonization of healthcare uh, in the global south. I, I just wanted to see if there's anything, any groups that you guys would point us in the direction of. I mean, for those in, in Washington state, I highly recommend connecting with Julie and the Washington Fair Trade Coalition. I don't know if she's gonna speak later, but um, APEC is coming to Seattle this summer. Uh, there's gonna be a big mobilization uh, around that. This is the um, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, um, where they're going to be discussing future trade agreements. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's a big, big opportunity to educate the community. It's a big, big opportunity to speak directly 
to many of the people who make these types of decisions. Uh, and so, I, you know, I just urge people to check out Washington Fair Trade's website and, and connect with them on, on that. Um, in terms of uh, specific advocacy in the health field, um, I don't know, Maz, if there's more to say about PVA and, and, and if others have, you know, other other in, in lanes they want to suggest. Yes, and um, thank you to Letty, who's working in the background here, and I know that she's going to share um, a couple of links. There is a link for the People's Vaccine Alliance there to, to sign up um, and to get information on, on upcoming actions, and same for Oxfam in the U.S. as well. I think that, you know, in working um, on People's Vaccine Alliance actions, what was so great was seeing Arthur's colleagues from around the United States on calls with organizers, you know, from Kathmandu to Lusaka, you know, to Guatemala City, everybody kind of working together and finding ways to have coordinated actions um, that have a, a big impact. So I would encourage, you know, Zachary to please look on, on all of the links that are available. Um, and then there's also, Aldo had to sign off, but that New York um, law that he spoke about, um, and I know that many of you are in Washington state, but it is such an opportunity to make a huge difference um, in one state in the United States, you know, so I know that um, people are writing letters from all over the world and really encouraging, um, you know, the, the U.S., the New York representatives, you know, here there's an opportunity where one state is holding more than half of the private debt um, that, that is owed by low and middle income countries. So that's also something that between now and June 8th, the big push is, is being made. If the law does not pass before June 8th, then it will you know, come back to the table um, in September. But the, the concern is that many of these private funds are sort of waking up to the fact that there is a movement rising to, to try and get this bill passed. So they, in the same way that pharmaceutical companies are very actively lobbying, you know, in the work that Arthur is doing, you know, they are also starting to, to lobby um, to make sure that the bill does not pass. So that's something that people can get involved in as well. Thank you, uh, Maza and Arthur, and for that question. Um, because of time, we're going to, I think, transition. There's a, there's a couple more. There's a couple more hands up, but we're going to segue now to show that slide that Maza mentioned um, because we don't want to lose uh, more people. I know people are going to have to go to dinner, and we want to talk about a call to action. Um, and so we'll talk just a, a bit about some of these. Um, the the goal of this forum is to both educate and to hopefully motivate people to become involved. And I'm going to invite, uh, is Julie Buana with us from Washington Fair Trade Coalition? Julie, are you there? Can you unmute and tell us about uh, links and actions locally that people can sign on to? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you everyone so much uh, for attending today and thank you so much to our wonderful panelists um, and questioners uh, for that really incredible information. Um, and yeah, again, you know, some folks um, kind of highlighted this, right, that that it's so important to have have these issues kind of explained and, and to receive that education. Um, but it's arguably more important to understand now what we can actually do about some of these issues. Um, and so there are a few links here. Um, some of them are um, petitions that, you know, take just a couple seconds uh, to sign on to. Um, so some of the um, New York uh, legislation um, around um, international debt, um, you know, just take a second to snap those QR codes. Um, Your sound. Hmm. Julie, I think you took out your headphones and we can't hear you. Julie, we lost you. Might be your headphones. Shoot, all these technical issues. Yeah, we still can't hear you, Julie. Sorry. Um, Julie, while while we're waiting to try to get your voice back, um, I'm going to make a few comments about on the right side of the screen. The New York governor, Kathy Hochul, 
must enact the New York Taxpayer and International Debt Crisis Protection Act. So this is the legislation going through New York State legislator, legislature now to try to um, uh, pressure and actually require private creditors um, to uh, basically provide debt relief, which is equivalent to what public, public creditors are providing. This is what uh, Aldo Cagliari was telling us about. So these are both places where you can jump right in now and urge them to pass this very, very important legislation. Um, uh, I and Amy Hagopian and Rachel and others here are working with the APHA to try to send in a, um, a letter, a memo of support uh, uh, from the American Public Health Association calling for, for debt relief in support of these bills. So this is a big uh, national and even global campaign, and this is a great way to get involved in that campaign. Um, Julie, did you? Yeah, I, you're okay. back. I am back. My um, headphones uh, picked the perfect moment to die. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, James, for, for giving us some context um, about that New York legislation. Um, some of the other QR codes there um, are, and all of these I'm sure will be sent out as well, um, are uh, around uh, these trade negotiations that are happening. Um, you know, Arthur mentioned that there aren't... Um, there aren't, you know, specific uh, um, vaccine, like patent protections um, and IP protections in these trade agreements, um, which is really great and again a victory. But there are a lot of um, well, first we have to kind of fight to keep those out, right? Um, it can be changed at any time, and big pharma is definitely hovering around the administration to add those protections in. Um, but on top of that, there are. Um, you know, different uh, chapters that can affect um, public health outside of just IP. So just as a quick example, for example, um, for example, uh, one of the uh, big lobbies that are, that have a lot of power in these trade negotiations um, is the big tech lobby. And part of their agenda is um, writing in protections that would allow them to freely ship, uh, store and trade our data. Um, which includes people's health data, right? And especially in a post-Roe world, um, that can have a, a, a really negative impact on um, uh, reproduct reproductive rights um, for you know, women and gender minorities, um, among many other things, right? Uh, that, uh, that are currently in this, in this trade agreement um, that aren't necessarily you know, um, patent protections, but that will affect public health. Um, and so there are lots of ways that folks can get involved in some of that trade organizing. I might put my email in the chat. Um, we also have um, uh, one of the first links there is a, uh, a petition um, that is being presented to some of these trade negotiators um, to prioritize you know, people over profit. Um, and then as Arthur mentioned, we have a really unique opportunity um, happening this summer in Seattle where trade negotiations are coming to our own backyard, right? So people will be here in person, trade officials from all of these countries um, negotiating this behind closed doors. And so we really have the opportunity um, to mount a really strong people power movement um, to, uh, you know, in encourage <laughs> um, the administration and trade negotiators to put people, the planet, public health, um, over uh, corporate profits. Um, so one of those links as well is, um, uh, is some more information about that and a place to um, sign up. There'll be a big mobilization as well as teach-ins and workshops. So, um, you know, definitely attend. It's going to be happening this summer and in, in, at the end of July. Um, and if you're extra interested, you know, we're always looking for people to help um, organize and mobilize. Um, and then one of those other links, um, the structural racism and men medical apartheid and global health um, action steps is actually a Google form um, that has a lot of these links, um, as well as uh, the different ways that people can get involved, the different um, groups that are, you know, working on um, these issues, including the Washington Fair Trade Coalition, um, as well as some of the other um, action steps that I've um, 
talked about. So if you are interested in getting a bit more um, involved, uh, obviously sending petitions is great, but um, there's a lot of other work that needs to be done. Um, so if you are interested, please scan that structural racism and medical apartheid and global health um, action step QR code um, and, uh, and, you know, fill in your information and let us know what you'd be interested in doing. And, and we will definitely reach out to you um, to get you plugged in. But um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Julie. That was that was wonderful. Julie's doing all kinds of stuff locally, so there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. Um, I'm wondering, Letty, if you could go to the next slide that had a other set. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to draw attention to the sign up for the HAI mailing list. There's an organization right here at UW called Health Advocacy International um, that includes people like Marianne Mercer, who is with us here today. Uh, Amy Hagopian, Hagopian, Julie Buana, um, myself, and others who are organizing around these things. If you want to join that particular listserv and grouping, you're very, very welcome. Um, and notice we have Oxfam, um, two different Oxfam options, the People Vaccine Alliance Twitter, People Vaccine Alliance uh, general link. So um, you, many of you may have attended the Gloyd lecture last week in which um, the speaker, Dr. Dr. Pai, said, uh, are we going to walk our uh, walk our talk in decolonizing oh, global health? Self. And now's the time to um, now's the time to walk our talk. These are the kinds of act activities and advocacy and activism we can all jump into uh, to influence um, these power dynamics in global health. And I think uh, before we sign out uh, real quickly, just one last opportunity for people to have uh, one or two final questions. Anybody in the audience have a question, a hand up? Julia Owens, you had had your hand up before. Maybe maybe that'll be our last question for the night. We're getting kind of late here. Go for it, Julia. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you all, all for the wonderful conversations that we had here today. It was very um, enlightening and beneficial. Um, I guess my question is, like, given that uh, with the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I think global apartheid was really brought to the forefront of um, healthcare and kind of awareness throughout the globe, especially with the idea of like vaccine nationalism. So I was wondering if y'all could possibly speak on, um, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic improved or maybe made worse the conversations of decolonization of the healthcare system? Mm -hmm. I can um, start because um, I do have I you know my my main thought about this and I'm sorry James what was the name of the questioner the Julie Julia Julia okay Julia. so you know Julia I think a lot about like how to you know um, this idea of not letting a crisis go to waste right I think we so many of us were. You know, I remember I'm embarrassed that I was teary eyed watching the first person get her mRNA vaccine or was it one of the first vaccines It was sort of, you know, there were cameras in the hospital as a woman in England and I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing, you know, the world has done something so great. And then, you know, I was naively thinking that we had made progress from the, you know, the time of the, the HIV pandemic. So I think that many of us are determined that this time around, like we could not be here because there will be another pandemic and we could not be here in the same situation, you know, having some people's lives so blatantly not matter while others, you know, are valued and, you know, um, the, the heads of pharmaceutical companies, you know, as I mentioned, the head of Moderna made $400 million last year. Um, and so I think for me, I feel that many of the inequalities that we knew that those of us who work in, in public health or in this field are aware of were really laid bare. And um, my I am determined that we cannot let this crisis go to waste. You know, this pandemic needs to be a portal towards a new way of being, you know, like not a return to normal because normal didn't work for, for the vast majority of us. And, you know, I, I did notice, um, you know, James, that you have a webinar coming up next week or in a couple of weeks that, you know, decolonization is is not a, a metaphor, you know, and that's really sort of how to make this real, you know, um, uh, yeah, all of these things are not academic, you know, they are real, people are dying, and how do we really, you know, um, and this is that that pandemic as a portal is really, is something that I heard from Arundhati Roy, the 
the Indian writer who early on had written this essay about how to have this pandemic be a portal to a new way of being. So I hope we can we can make that happen. So thank you for the question. And I hope that everyone will be inspired to be a, a part of that. And, you know, I really appreciate Julie sharing all those ways to get involved. You know, I really feel like there's so many different ways. Not everybody has to do it in the same way. You know, if you're really good at tech, there are things you can do around tech. If you're really good at getting out in the street and yelling, you know, there are ways to do that. If you're an artist, there are ways to do that. So, you know, there are many, many ways to, to get involved. So I'd really encourage you all um, to do that. So thank you. Thank you for that question. If, if there's no other question, uh, if there's no more questions, and Arthur, I don't know if you wanted to jump in with that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll just say that, I mean, the fact that mRNA vaccines are not being produced around the world right now is in my view a crime against humanity. Um, I, I wish we had been more aggressive from the start in the US um, in our campaigning. I'll, I'll say very frankly and somewhat undiplomatically, uh, I wish our, our partners in Europe had not been, you know, sort of so defeatist and, and laissez-faire about what was possible with their governments. Um, I, I will say again, as I said earlier, like it's easy to be disheartened um, but we are starting to see some shifts in, you know, the, the power <laughs> that Big Pharma has right now. and We need to take advantage of that. I'll also just add, sort of as an aside, Julie mentioned, um, Big Tech is trying to rig our trade deals right now, just like Big Pharma did 30 years ago. And so not only does this affect people's personal medical data and whether they'll have control over it, but also uh, government's abilities to influence AI. And I'm sure most of the people on this call know much better than me um, that AI is going to play a big, big role in future medical treatment development um, and also in the provision of public health services. Um, and the idea that we're going to allow, <laughs> a, you know, big tech to block regulations through trade agreements that affect racial bias, gender bias, other abuses in AI um, is just something we can't allow to happen right now. Otherwise, the young people on this call will be having the same conversation about AI 30 years from now that we're having about, far, you know, rules of pharma gun to trade agreements 30 years back. Um, so I, I really encourage people to connect with Julie on that issue. It's, it's now is the time to make a difference on that. Great. Thank you. And I think we're going to wrap up. Rachel has some word of thanks. I wanted to give just a quick program announcement, and, and Maza already mentioned it, which is next week on the 30th at 3.30 in the afternoon, we are also having another webinar sponsored by the uh, DEI committee um, of the Department of Global Health on decolonization is not a metaphor, a title of an important article that was circulated widely around decolonizing global health. Uh, Dr. Paul Park, um, who is uh, affiliate faculty here at University of Washington, our very own Dr. Uh, Ferdinand Mukambang, who is with us today, and then Bonnie Duran, also a uh, faculty member here at UW. It's going to be a yeah, really thanks. wonderful uh, event. So we invite everybody to join us for that one as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rachel for some final words. And thanks to everyone. Thank you, everyone. There are so many people that helped make this event happen. Um, Julie Buena, thank you so much for the heavy lifting you did in bringing these beautiful, brilliant speakers to us. Letty Munoz for tech um, and helping make this a real, actually happening event. All the people on the DEI committee, Marianne Mercer, Amy Hagopian, Ferdi Mukambang again, Ravi Yanusa, Hilma Makambale, and I want to give a special thanks to all of our speakers one more time for doing such beautiful braiding work and, and making it clear that um, we have to have intersectional thinking for this to be, to, to, for this to all this to work. And I want to end, Maza, just quoting you, uh, who is quoting someone else. And Arundhati Roy, let this moment be a portal to a new way of being. And I think that's the best, best place for us to end. So let this moment be a new portal 
a portal to a new way of being. So exciting to see this next generation, Cyril, uh, Julia, all the rest who came. And thank you for your time and your brilliance really and your really hope. Um, One more final thought. Um, if you have follow-up questions, you didn't get all those links on your phone, feel free to email me. Um, my name, my, my email is jamespf at uw.edu. If you want to connect with any of those sign-up opportunities, and I'd be happy to get those out. We will be posting uh, all of those links also on the DGH website with Letty's help, and so they'll be available. Um, but thank you to everyone for coming and for staying long. You know, sometimes when we have a lot of people involved, we went a little long, but uh, very exciting. And we had over 100 people at one point for uh, almost an hour and a half in. So pretty, pretty great. Huge thanks, Arthur, Maza, everybody. And uh, let's go out and enjoy the springtime and the sunshine. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Letty. Thank you, Carrie.